Okay. Um, welcome to this session. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Today we're going to hear from Andy about um, simple, fast software networking with SNUM. Um, Andy works with a software consultancy based in Spain um, and has been working on SNUB for about three years. Thank you. Can everyone hear? Yeah? Great. So thanks for coming. It is a pleasure to be at LCA. It's my first LCA. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, and today this talk is a talk uh, sharing the, the joy that I have hacking on, on SNAB. And it has three parts. The first part is a um, it, it is, is about user space networking, the rise of, of this new thing that lets us, the hackers, uh, hack on high-speed network switches and, and such, which used to be the domain of the silicon people. And then I introduce SNAB a bit, SNAB, the networking toolkit. And then we spend a bit of time talking about our experience um, writing different network functions in SNAB. Uh, and, and getting them put into production and, and uh, interesting things we have found out along this way. So, story time. Um, so let's, let's imagine, I guess we can all close our eyes and, and think to ourselves, like imagine you are an ISP, right? And the year is you know, 2000, distant past. And so you think about what you need to set up your business. You, you know, lease your access to your customers, you lease your DS DSL exchanges and such, your upstream bandwidth, you install your core routers, you figure out how to get some money, and you're done, right? I don't know, this is my uh, idealized vision of being an ISP. I, I'm not actually an ISP as you can tell, and all you ISP people are laughing at me now. <laughs> but, but in any case, like the, your, what you have to do, like your core business, it, it's, it's fairly limited to just providing internet. But if we go forwards in time, you see, well, let's say 2005 or so, this is when, at least in my, uh, I live in France now, and, and since about 2005, all the phones have been provided through the DSL boxes, and I guess that's the case now as well. Um, it's the only reason people call on landlines these days is because they managed to make it free with VoIP. Uh, so you're, you're not only having the, the old thing you had, but you also have in your data center something doing VoIP, right? Some sort of server processors that linking telephones and such. And then as time goes on, it's like, okay, not only am I paying for all these things that I you know, was doing in the past, I have to upgrade my, my DSLs and my core routers, and I'm still paying for bandwidth, but now I'm serving TV. You know? Now I'm serving video on demand, now I'm running private cloud stuff, maybe public cloud things, denial of service protection, I'm running out of IPv4 space, uh, IPv6 is obviously coming and people are asking me about it. Uh, and, and I'm just getting paid the same, <laughs> right? You know, I don't know about y'all, but I've been kind of frustrated that my monthly bills have not been going down, but they're probably frustrated that they're not going up. That they have to do like a lot more on, on the same uh, subscriber base, basically. And, so, and that is the, the trend uh, which I hear from operators, is that over time they have to do a lot more, and they have to do it on uh, effectively the same budget. And, and doing more in the context of, of an ISP is means uh, putting a bunch of expensive boxes in a rack. And, and the costs are quite high uh, because each function you need to have is a, a specialized box and the industry is set up in such a way that like, you know, per port it could cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or something. And this is in the ISP case, uh, but, but similar things happen uh, inside corporate networks or uh, in many other networking environments. And, and the question, of course, is, is there a better way? And I'm you know, giving this presentation today, and so obviously the answer is yes. Um, but I want to uh, touch on a, a parallel development that's happened. You know, we've gone through uh, 15 years of history. Surely some, something must have changed in the computing landscape such that we can do different things. And that thing that, that changed is actually the kind of the rise of the commodity Intel Xeon server with commodity high-speed PCI network interfaces. And these days, if you go and you buy a machine and you're going to slot it <coughs> into your rack, you're probably buying, you know, a, a, a two-socket, four-socket machine, perhaps, with many cores per socket. You can slot in there many, many uh, PCI uh, 
network cards, each of which probably has you know, two uh, 10 gigabit ports on it. And so this is what you can actually connect together with wires. Uh, and so then you need to look at, OK, I can get all this bandwidth, but am I actually going to be able to have the, the resources on the CPU to, to process this? And OK, OK, right, let's look at, um, we, can, we can add it all up. We can get 100 or 200 uh, gigabits per second per server or so. You can get more, but like this is a very standard commodity uh, configuration. But if you divide it out, what you need to do, if you're talking about the smallest packets, the 64-byte packets that come in, you need to handle about 10 or 15 million of these a second, <coughs> which if you divide that you know, into the 1E9, uh, you get 70 nanoseconds per packet, which is tight, <coughs> right? But you can do it. And now, I don't know about y'all, but my, my, my hack senses start to, start to tingle, and I see the nice challenge of uh, actually hitting this uh, limit on all the packets and we know that you know we have enough instructions. We should have enough instructions. So let's let's figure out how to do it. And so that's that's the real uh, change in the industry. Um, uh, but the the material conditions are there. But but what does the software look like now? Like how we have this uh, story in our minds, like the, the Linux story that you know Linux is conquering the world and it's going to be everywhere. A and this. Conventional wisdom you know, tells me, like the story informs me, that if I open the doors and I stroll down the racks of you know, your operator, <coughs> that I look and I see servers and they're all running commodity Xeon uh, servers and they have these commodity network interfaces and they all run the Linux kernel and the Linux kernel hand handles all the networking and concert with the user space programs and everything's wonderful. And that to an extent is, is true. Um, but it's not true in the way that you would think. It's not true in the way that the narrative tells you that, that it should be. And, and the question is, is, okay, hardware appears to be ready for 10 million packets per second on Linux per core, uh, but is Linux the kernel? And, and that answer is really no. Um, and and the, the reason is, is a, a little complicated that essentially um, <coughs> Linux, the kernel, Linux, the networking stack, does a lot of things. And that lot of things is not always what you want. But it does impose a, a fairly uh, constant overhead on your network processing. So that's one um, barrier towards getting real uh, nice line rate, 10 gigabit performance on, on Linux. And another one is that um, usually Linux doesn't do all that you want. Linux does part of what you want, and then you code your network function, which is the sort of abstraction over either a, a box <coughs> slotted into a rack or something written in software which does the same thing. You code your network function as a user space application. And maybe you code it to the sockets API, or maybe uh, you use some sort of backdoor with um, PF ring or something. But part of your program is essentially running in the kernel, and part of your program is running in user space. And, and that's not really a nice way to design one network function to have it be split in two parts and to have the communications costs going back and forth. Uh, so what we, what we see to actually reach this performance is something that's called user space networking. And, and then the general idea is that, OK, we're going to make a network function, but this network function is, is not really going to involve the kernel. So we begin by telling Linux to forget about this PCI device, <coughs> which you can do by uh, writing something to some file in, in, in sys. And then you mmap that PCI device, your network inter interface. You mmap its registers directly into your user space. And at that point, you're writing a driver in user space. You poke the registers, you bring up the card, you read the data sheet, you, know, you have a driver in user space. And um, you set up a ring buffer to get some packets going. And at that point, you, know, you can you know, pull off the receive ring buffer and send to your transmit ring buffer. And, and you can write your network function. And that's how people do it these days. Uh, SNAB is a toolkit for building applications like this. DPDK is uh, a project started by Intel, the Data Plane Development Kit. Uh, I, s I was looking, and it, it's much more popular. <laughs> uh, but I looked at, at its first public commit, and it was after SNAB's first public commit. So I can, you know, <coughs> SNAB, SNAB was there first, right, in 2012. And then recently, there have been a, a few more open source ones released. Uh, Cisco open sourced their vector packet processing. Um, and they made a foundation around it called FDIO. I'm not sure how they're doing these days. It's one of these um, Linux Foundation foundations, you know? Wow. OK. So as, as a vendor, 
vendors are, are attempting to get back a bit of power. Sorry, operators are attempting to, to get back a bit of uh, deployment power from uh, their device vendors. And so, for example, I know that, that Deutsche Telekom has a, a pilot project, which is not really in production yet, called TerraStream. And one of the ideas of this is that uh, they're going to tell their customers, uh, don't give me a box, right? Give me a virtual machine, and I will run your network function uh, either in, a, as a VM, and I'll provide it the networking, or uh, in some cases, they'll, they'll run it just as a normal process without virtualization. But in any case, it's software, right? Provide me your function, your router, your video on demand, your what have you, as software, not as, as hardware. And, and I will provide the, the commodity hardware on which to run. OK, so that, that's the sort of uh, picture of the network and, and where things have gone. And now I'd like to lead you into a bit of introduction onto SNAP. And as an aside, to begin this, the SNAB project uh, aims to be something that uh, is, is coined uh, rewritable software. And the, the term comes from Jonathan Reese, who did a bunch of work on, I, I'm a schemer at heart, so I have to confess. <laughs> so uh, Jonathan Reese did a bunch of uh, the scheme language standards. He wrote Scheme 48. So he's somebody who like searches for elegant solutions in the problem space. And that actually takes a lot of work, right? Like you might end up with something that is small and elegant, but it takes a lot of work to find that elegant program within all the space of complexity that could solve your problem. And so the goal of rewritable software is, is to actually um, prioritize and value that search, but in such a way that when you have your result, your, your simple result, it's something that you can explain to your friends, you can explain to your colleagues, and then when you're done, the person says, oh, is that all? I can rewrite that in a weekend. And, and I would like for you all to feel uh, that way at the end of this talk. So SNAP, right? I'm, I'm going to you know, tell, <coughs> tell you like, how to rewrite SNAP. It, it's very simple. It's just maybe five or six slides. So the SNAP design is that a SNAP program is composed of apps. Right? And these apps are linked together. They're connected by directional links. And then a program, the, the network function is itself, processes packets in units of breaths. OK, so I'll dive into each one of these things. So I, I'm going to show a little bit of code just to keep things concrete and not, not hand wavy. Here, this uh, slide shows the creation of a graph of apps. And SNAB is written in Lua, uh, and it uses specifically the Lua JIT implementation of Lua uh, for speed. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, the beginning is just importing a couple of modules, basically. Those require statements, import the modules that define those apps. And you see one of them is the Intel 82599, which to network people means your standard commodity NIC. A and the other one is a simple filter, which will filter um, expressions written in the, in the language that TCP dump accepts. We actually have our own compiler for this language. So after importing these modules, uh, we create a configuration, which is the graph of apps. We instantiate a couple of apps, the, the NIC app and the filter app. And the last argument is, is the configuration that will be passed to that app when you instantiate. So the NIC gets instantiated with a PCI address, and the filter gets instantiated with a, a filter string. So it's only going to pass packets which, mat which uh, match this TCP port 80 string. Then I add those directional links between the apps. You can see I link the, the Nix TX uh, output, so to speak, to the input, uh, input on, on the filter app. And I link the filter again to the Nix so that we're, we're receiving the packets and then we're pushing them back out. And then en engine.configure actually uh, applies that graph to the running uh, program. And then essentially the end is a while true uh, do this breathe thing. And, and the question is, well, right, at this point, what's, what's breathe? By the way, I'm, I'm happy with questions in, in the middle. Uh, I'm also happy if you save <coughs> it to the end. So a, as you like, especially with these code things, it can be useful if something's completely unintelligible to interrupt the speaker. So that's fine, too. So breaths. Uh, a breath is how SNAB processes packets. And it, be, it has two phases. One, you inhale packets into the network. And then after that, you process those packets. So inhalation is just. Look at all the apps that have pull functions. And this is in a very um, duck typey, Python y way. You literally look at the apps and see if they have a pull property, which is assumed to be a function. And you run those pull functions. And that will inhale some batch of packets into your network. 
and, and push them on the output uh, of, of those apps. And then you run all the apps with push functions. And uh, you can actually run them in any order. Uh, we, we run them in a sorted order so that usually at the end of a, of a breath, uh, all of the links are, are empty. Now, I'll show links actually as well. So, right, let, let's take another look at this. Here is a pull function. Uh, I, I removed a couple of things from this pull function, uh, but this is almost exactly uh, the precise code to pull in packets from the NIC. Um, we only pull in a limited amount of packets, regardless of how many are actually available, or we pull up to a maximum amount of packets, just to keep the latency somewhat regular. Uh, and that maximum number of packets is currently about 100. So the, the batch size is around 100 packets when, when we're processing. So yeah. Uh, or, or do you actually write this little bit yourself usually? This is the implementation of the Intel A2599 app, which is part of SNAB. And so I'm just showing it as an example of a pull function. Yeah. Yeah, so like when you're actually building um, a SNAB program, it looks more like this, right? You don't have to actually implement these apps because it comes with a number of apps. Uh, but it helps to actually uh, show these things because uh, there's really just not that much there, you know? And, and if I don't show this, you get to thinking like, oh, this is a complicated framework and there's lots going on in this pull function. And, and that's actually not true. And that's, that's one of the big uh, points of the talk. So uh, we have a device driver and it's written in Lua. Uh, get a little, talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But it, it's simply, you know, there's a ring buffer on that device and we're pulling packets off the ring buffer. Um, similarly, this is a push function. Uh, and Push functions typically will empty all the incoming packets on their link. So until the input link is empty, I'm going to receive a packet. And then if that predicate function, this accept function, which has been compiled from the TCP dump language. So if you recall, when I instantiated this app, I gave it TCP port 80. That ends up being compiled into this function, this accept fn. So uh, if that function returns true, and this p.data is just a pointer to the beginning of the packet, of length bytes, then I transmit it on the output, and otherwise I, I drop it. And that's all there is, right? So that, that's all there is to breaths. Then you might wonder what a packet is. So uh, how many of you have hacked on kernel networking before? I, I mean, this must be a relief. Like, th there's no SK buffs. <laughs> there, there's no link lists. It's, it's literally a buffer that can hold your biggest MTU, which in our case is 10,000 uh, bytes, and, and a length field. And, and we don't try to keep things on the device. We, uh, we rely on the device uh, transferring the whole packet to L3 using DDIO. Uh, and at that point, uh, you take the hit when getting it into cache. And then uh, you don't have to spend a bunch of complexity and, and mental thought on whether it fits into your um, SK buffs or whatever, like whether it has multiple buffers or, or what have you. So th that's a packet and that's all there is. Um, what we do do, and, and I'll just mention this for the LCA audience, this, uh, this, this pointer does go to the middle of a region. And so if we want to prepend some data onto this packet, we'll actually move the pointer a bit and then fill in the data so we don't have to copy so much. But that's just a hack. So I just mentioned that for y'all. Right. And so what's a link? Uh, we saw these links, the things that we push on and the things that we pull from or the things we send or receive on. It's just a ring buffer, right? And, and we have a static limit on, on how big they are. If, if more packets, these, are, these connect apps inside your network function. And if you end up trying to push more packets than 1024 on these things, it'll just drop them. And there are a couple of fields on, on struct that I alighted, uh, which are just counters for how many bytes have been transmitted and how many packets have been dropped and things like that. But otherwise, it, it's simply a ring buffer. And that's all there is. Right? So y you can go and rewrite SNAB right now. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's all there is. A and I, I, I think it's a really great exercise to give it a go, um, be it in Luigit and reusing our drivers or in Rust or in or whatever else you want to use. But you might want to use SNAB as it is. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about like, what, what SNAB is like and how we design SNAB and where, where we're going. So 
these these principles they're, they're um, I made these up uh, and I'm I am a snap core contributor but not like the the maintainer I, I think they're good principles for snap and I think they reflect the, <laughs> the consensus but they, they haven't been centrally blessed anyway here's the doubt of snap that simple is better than than complex that small is better than large and that we prefer commodity over proprietary and okay let's go through these and see what it means what, what does simple mean in the context of snap well we try to compose our network functions out of small building blocks linked together. Obviously, the Unix pipeline uh, metaphor is you know, one that, that works in our world. Uh, for example, the, the app we had before read from the NIC, and it went to our PCAP filtering app, and it went back out to the NIC. Well, what if we want to actually deal with fragmentation? Well, then just add a reassembly app before your filter, and add a fragment app afterwards to handle your, whatever MTU your network is on. Uh, and these apps can be individually developed and, and quite simple, and you, you sort of pull them together in that graph at runtime. Uh, and, and another example of simple is our definition of, of packet and link. I mean, you can try to like optimize that, but at some point, um, you, you can win on some benchmarks, but not on other, but you certainly lose like in the mental space and your ability to change things and rewrite things. So, so we, we definitely prefer simple when we have a choice. For small, uh, when SNAP was originally written in uh, 2012, 13, 14, we had a code budget, actually, of 10,000 lines and that the whole thing should build in a minute, including all of its dependencies. And the idea was that these constraints on the project should drive us to uh, solve problems in a creative way. Uh, and I think, um, I think Don Newth did uh, some, some work in, in this regard, like constraint-driven programming. It, what helped us in, in the, um, not in SNAP, I don't mean to claim that Don Newth worked on SNAP. <laughs> what helped us in, in the context of SNAP was using LuaJIT. Uh, LuaJIT itself is included in that one minute build budget, uh, and it allows us to write very short uh, code at relatively high levels of abstraction, <coughs> but which burns away at runtime because it has an excellent virtual machine that does excellent just in time compilation. Uh, so that's really been what, what allowed us to reach. Uh, the rates, the high performance that we have. Um, we also, uh, we, do, we do the Rommel thing of, of lithification, if you all saw the previous talk. Uh, we include our dependencies, including LuaJIT, PFLua, the compiler from uh, the TCP dump language, LJ syscall, which allows us access to all system calls on, on Linux, which is a delight, not to have to wait for them in Glibc or whatever, and DINASM, which allows us to emit uh, x86 assembly directly from uh, directly from within Lua code, which is I'll maybe cover that in a, in a bit, or y'all can ask questions about that too. But what you end up with is a statically linked binary. Well, it's dynamically linked to libc, but that's the only thing, right? So you can you can copy it around, and, and it all works, and you can deliver just this binary, and your customer can run it even though they're on whatever distro that you didn't compile on. Small also means that we we don't. Um, depend on big projects. And so a common question uh, from people that understand the networking space is why wouldn't you use the drivers from DPDK, which is um, a, a big project with lots of drivers, lots of vendor participation. A and the answer is that like the data plane is really, I mean, that's the problem we're solving, right? So the driver is included in that. Like we need to be able to, to work on the whole thing. A and so that means it's not the kernels and it's not DPDKs either. And you end up with just a thousand lines per card or so. Like that's the size of our drivers. So that it, it, it's much better than uh, working around somebody, somebody else's abstractions to be able to, ju to just say, okay, you know, we'll handle it ourselves. Um, and, and this ties into the networking cards as well. So when you think about a, a, a network function that's written in SNAB, like what, what is the value you're providing by writing this network function? Like, you're not providing special value by using a Xeon server because that's just what you're using, right? You're not providing special value by using um, a NIC because you could use any NIC uh, for which you have drivers. Like, you just need the packets, basically. And you don't provide s special value by using SNAB because SNAB doesn't actually emit your network function uh, on its own. And SNAB is open source Apache 2.0 license. It's just like the, the function you write, right? It's not the, the other parts. And so you want to make the other parts as... as interchangeable as possible. And so in the case of, of the cards, uh, we want to have our own drivers, but we want to uh, be able to rely on very basic features for them, but not vendor a huge um, abstraction layer uh, kind of driver from, from, the, from the network card vendor. 
So Intel's 82599, they have great data sheets out. You can just write a driver. In this sense, it's rewritable because the specification of the card is out there. If you need to rewrite another driver, you can just do that. But it's been hard with other uh, network card manufacturers. What we did say is that we would not include a driver for the Mellanox cards until they released an open data sheet. And so they released, uh, after a while, they released open data sheets for their Connect X4 cards, which go up to 100 gigabits, because of our project. Because the operators were saying, look, you know, we want your card, but we want it in Snab, but Snab's not accepting your stuff until you open your data sheets, so you know, get them out there. And, and there are also uh, other interfaces to test under TAP interfaces or what have you, um, but uh, that, that's less performance and better for testing. Uh, and commodity for us also means we're not going to rely on special features of the NIC. We're going to try to do things in CPU as, if possible. But that also means we get to just double down on, on SIMD, AVX2, AVX512, whenever it arrives. Uh, and for example, uh, TCP checksum offloading is a common topic that you know, comes up on LWN every couple years or so. We don't bother with it, right? You just write your routine in, in AVX2, and that's that. And, and it's not actually an overhead. So. Uh, the project itself is about five years old now. Uh, last year, there were 27 patch authors. Um, I counted up. Anyway, a bunch of, bunch of stats here. And as far as I know, it's, it's deployed in about a dozen sites or so. And the biggest data planes that we have are a virtual switch, which is kind of like open vSwitch. Um, it runs just in user space, called the NFV. Uh, the, a core router for a IPv6 transition technology called Lightweight 4 over 6, the Lightweight AFTR. There's a VPN running at uh, switch.ch, which is like RNet, the academic network, but in Switzerland. Uh, and our, our new work of the last year has been some multi-process coordination stuff to be able to um, combine a control plane and a data plane, uh, support uh, for running SNAB as a guest in a virtualized system, and some integration with control plane stuff, which probably means something to you if you work in the networking world. Um, but if you're coming at it as, as I did before uh, from the more generalist programming side, uh, it's a bit more specialized. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit, I got 10 minutes to talk about uh, our experiences with the uh, LDB AFTR. So the company I work for uh, developed this uh, kind of centralized router and it's been, um, I don't know how much I can talk about deployment, so I'll not. It's basically the central, um, you can think of it like a NAT server for an ISP except it doesn't track individual flows. It relates um, partitions of IPv4 addresses to certain customers. But it ends up you can have like a, quite a big, essentially a routing table, a binding table they call it in the middle, maybe two million entries or so. Uh, and you need to do lookup on every incoming packet to see like which entry uh, does it match. And, and this is the central uh, service for IPv4 as a service on IPv6 network, uh, IPv6 only network. So what does it mean? Well. It means that if, if your operator decides to deploy this IPv6 transition technology, then all IPv4 internet will be flowing through this software, which is a bit of stress, right? So, uh, and our, our target for, our, for this deployment was uh, using two NICs, 20 gigabits a second, and four, four million packets per second per core. So the challenges in roughly order was first, okay, let's make sure that we can actually hit the, the throughput bandwidth that we need. Uh, let's make sure it doesn't lose packets which is another metric that, you know, it's very important. Uh, make sure that it integrates well. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, earlier with some of the example of the push and the pull functions you were talking about, uh, that it might just drop packets. Does it keep statistics of drop packets or anything that you can then see? Um, dropping packets internally is rare. What, what dropping packets means from the context of it usually means you haven't designed. It like right, uh, right. What what happens? Like dropping packets usually manifests itself by not servicing a receive ring buffer fast enough. Yeah, yeah. Do you keep statistics of if you do miss or something so you know to yeah. go back? Uh, well, what what would you do? Like if you've dropped a packet, you you can't do anything. So like if you if you go through the 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 receive buffer and you've just missed, you just, oh, well, keep going and process. I, it's just a metric to show you, okay, first of all, you need to be able to process packets fast enough, right? It, it uh, just a question in regards to this. Uh, does it 
provide like acknowledgement or something if it loses the packet? No, you just get, uh, so what, you, what the network card gives you is you configure a, a ring buffer, right, uh, on the receive side. And it's filling packets from the, from the wire, right? And you have to visit it so often. And if you, if you have like a latency spike, it could be that it's filled that buffer a couple times and you come back to it. And, and so those packets are just gone, right? What you do get is a counter on the network card that says how many packets have been received and, or, or how many packets have been actually dropped. Like that comes from the card. I internally to the, um, to the network as well, on each link you have a counter to see if you've dropped packets. But usually if you drop packets, um, because there's no back pressure within SNAB itself, uh, usually, it depends on the app, but that's the way we write it uh, these days, you either drop packets on exit because uh, your last ring buffer has filled up and, and the, um, the NIC can't take it fast enough, or you drop it on ingress at the card because you're not servicing the ingress fast enough. I don't know if I've answered the question. I'd, I'd be happy to re revisit this one, um, but just since I'm getting all these cards here in the front, I should probably just uh, show the five slides. And yeah, great. So, um, so th these are the challenges in general, and I'll talk about how we did on these. So on the fast side, generally, you don't have to do much work, right? In, in terms of getting good throughput, LuaJIT does a great job, and, and it does a surprising job. And I, I have a compiler's background. I used to work on like V8s, uh, the, the JavaScript engine, SpiderMonkey and such. Uh, and it's just really impressive what LuaJIT does. Like, it's, it's world class. Uh, and the, the design of SNAB as a sequence of ac apps connected, which process batches of packets at a time, actually plays to the strengths of LuaJIT. Because uh, you end up having lots of little loops to, that do <coughs> small things, like that transfer things from the incoming uh, ring buffer on the card to the outgoing ring buffer from the first app to the next app. And, and you just have little loops that do all these things. And so that lets LuaJIT um, have a loop that's small enough that it can uh, compile that as one trace and it will hoist all the loop invariant code, uh, loop invariant things to the top of the trace so they don't get hit on every uh, iteration through the loop, uh, which really burns away the, the dynamism of Lua. As you know, with like Lua and JavaScript and Python, these things, you can be munch monkey patching your uh, objects all the time, and, and you can't know statically that, oh, this isn't going to be changing. But at runtime, these things don't change. And so that's what these optimizing virtual machines like LuaJIT are able to do. It's, it's produce like that excellent performance after having seen that in one loop iteration, actually nothing is changing. Um, and, and, that, and that's what trace compilation gives you. Additionally, um, there is some allocation that happens sometimes in uh, Lua. Just you, you write something, it's going to make some allocation. But if Lua can see that whole uh, trace, or maybe a whole uh, tree of traces, um, it can sync the allocation to all the side edges. And if it can prove that on, for example, the main loop iteration, that uh, the allocation won't be necessary, it uses something called scalar replacement to completely eliminate it. And so we don't actually see garbage collection happening at all on our apps. Scalar, uh, scalar replacement eliminates all allocation for us. It does require a bit of tuning, though. Uh, and, and speed tips. Uh, uh, that is a complete other talk, <laughs> so I, I, can, I can go into that very happily. But one thing that uh, has helped us is Lua, LuaJet's FFI helps access um, data, describe data using C interfaces. So like that struct, I say ffi.cdef struct packet you know, in that C uh, syntax, and that's what I get. And that's, I'm able to access it from Lua in a very nice way, but I know that um, the representation of the data is, is this certain way, and I know that when I access it from Lua that I, it's getting compiled down to nice instructions and such. The real um, key for fast performance is to provo uh, avoid de data dependency chains, which means if you're going to have like a lookup table, you can't have a you know, buckets and chains hash table. Because if you need to look something up, you get your bucket, and then you get the next one, and the next one, and the next one, like the normal hash table construction. You can't do that, right? You, you need to uh, avoid any uh, lookup into memory depending on any other lookup into memory. Uh, if you have 250 nanoseconds per packet, which is our uh, use case for the lightweight after, and one memory reference has a latency of 80 nanoseconds or so, you just don't have enough time, right? You can maybe get one, right? You can get one pretty solid, right? You can budget for that. But you can't budget really for two or three, certainly not three. Uh, so uh, these little loops let us um, get a kind of bandwidth delay product. Like you're downloading a really big file from Australia. You know when you visit a web page and it's got a bunch of small resources, it's going to be terribly slow because of the latency. But you can still get really good bandwidth if you just start it and let it uh, fill up. And that's what we do, basically. Like, 
it, you take a batch of 32 packets and you're going to look up into a routing table or so, make all 32 lookups and then get the answers for all 32 of them. And that way you, you hit the latency for just uh, one or two, depending on the parallelism uh, of lookup in your, in your processor. And Haswells can do uh, 16 uh, L2 misses uh, in parallel at a time. So that's, that's what lets us do that. Additionally, uh, we have to decrease uh, latency, as I said, avoiding allocations. But we also have to avoid syscalls because that can introduce a bit of jitter for us. Uh, and if you S-trace our processes, nothing happens, which is wonderful. It's just completely silent. Um, and uh, there, there's another, this is, there's a lot of tuning uh, that it takes to, to reduce your latency. I, I thought it was bad when I did, used to do low latency uh, real-time audio stuff. But this is much worse. It's fun, though. <laughs> yeah. So, um, to integrate with an operator's network, well, it's complicated, you know, because there are many, many operators. Um, but uh, I'll just put out there right now that um, the thing we delivered last year was uh, enough Yang uh, to be able to integrate with external netconf agents. And these are words that, you know, help people in get a, a SNAP data plane. Because SNAP is really all about the data plane, right? The, the control plane and management stuff on, on top is really just to let us be deployed. Uh, right, I'll, I'll just skip forward here. So finally, uh, scale is kind of a work in progress in a sense. Like you, we have single uh, instances that work well, but 100 gigabit means that we are going to have to have multiple processes working uh, to service the same NIC. Um, the drivers are just now coming in. Even the Mellanox Connect X 400 gigabit cards can't actually give you 100 gigabits because of PCIe limitations. They're going to have to rev the card and produce another one. So it's, it's lots of exciting stuff. Um, the other thing to do is um, when you have multiple instances uh, to tell some router on the other side, hey, actually, I'm active. Um, so you can make a fleet of, of horizontally scaling um, SNAP instances. Work in progress, definitely. OK, so it seems I, I'm getting close to the end of the time. Uh, there's a lot more uh, going on in the SNAP world. Um, I, I was mostly focusing on the lightweight after. There's also a virtual switch that sits on, on top that uh, is deployed in some networks. Um, we have, because we're able to um, just focus on Xeon servers, it means we get to emit all the nice AMD64 assembly we want, including all the performance timers that we want. And so it's also another project for this year just to uh, do some recording of, of so some better online instrumentation so that you can understand uh, actually how your, your app interacts with all the distinct parts of a modern processor. Um, we get to, yeah, the emitting assembly runtime also lets us, uh, for example, emit uh, an optimized lookup procedure that is optimized for the particular hash table in consideration. Lots of interesting stuff. So uh, I'm happy to talk about these things. Um, but uh, out of time, so thanks very much. And I would say, make a thing with Snap. It, just check it out. It, it goes like that. Uh, and that's it. So uh, and hit me up on the Twitters. Questions? OK. Um, Given that there are no questions, I might start it off. Um, do you have, is there anything very cute that you'd like to see SNAB in implemented in? Not really uh, sensible, but uh, is there something that you'd just go, ah, oh, if you got someone to do a re-implementation? Oh, a re-implementation? Oh, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to see SNAB in Rust, actually. I mean, I, th I think that'd be really nice. Any other questions? A lot of things are done with this, most of the like, software, um, most of the function based on the software. But still, I want to ask, like, what's the hardware functional part of this snap? So, in let's see if I understand your question correctly. Um, what what do we rely on from the network uh, network device, for example? We don't rely on very much. Uh, the NFV switch can take advantage of like the um, SRIOV stuff when, when supplying interfaces to, to virtual machines. Uh, but in general, we want, we want to just get 
the incoming packet stream. Right? We want to just get you know, the struct packets on a ring buffer. And then we want to handle everything else in the software. And to the extent that we need to rely on something like RSS, for example, it's, it's a compromise and a failure, uh, one that is acceptable in some contexts, but, but not how we would like to work. And the reason is, is that um, an operator uh, might say, OK, I'm deploying on these cards. And then a vendor comes and say, oh, you know, I, what about these cards? And, and you want to be able to swap them out. And you want to be able to play deals against each other. And on our side of the software, we don't really want to care very much about that. So we try to not, not rely on anything from the, from the hardware. You also don't want to rely on firmware bugs for new features. So, <laughs> yeah. Just one more later question. Um, yeah. Does it follow like a routing table mechanism or something to search for the route? D does Snap follow routing table mechanisms to search for the, sorry? Routes, like where to send ah. up? Uh, yeah, so we have apps for like ARP, NDP, things like this, right? Um, but we don't benefit from anything in the kernel, for example. Uh, what there has been, so Juniper ha sells a version of SNAB, which routes a lot of control plane protocols to an uh, embedded VMX engine. So in some deployments, that can be an interesting thing. And in some, a uh, full routing engine is not necessary, and you can just use the embedded you know, next hop ARP and NDP stuff. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, say that you were playing with SNAB on just a small uh, machine that you were going to uh, do some firewalling with. Is it possible to make a, a local interface? Um, because, I mean, you're in user space, and to produce the interface, you'd have to go through the kernel. How uh, would that work, or is that not? Yeah, you can. I mean, you can use a tap interface, for example, uh, and you can operate on on the kernel interfaces that way. And you can also operate if you're virtualized on the the Virtio Net interfaces as well. So that can be a, a useful thing to do, also. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. If there's anyone interested, going once. <laughs> hey, uh, with your app earlier on, you mentioned per core PPS numbers. Um, were you 20 gigabits full line rate? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet. Uh, at, at those numbers, so that's about 500 byte packets or so, which is not like the smallest uh, packet. Yeah, but if you had smaller packets, would you still be full line rate? Or? It depends on the, the network function. In this case, the lightweight after requires a uh, hit to uh, this 2 million entry uh, routing table, and I don't think we get that right now. But for the NFV, uh, it's, it can certainly do that, yeah. Okay. And is it possible to, say, scale horizontally and just have a whole lot of cores uh, to deal with that sort of issue? That is the plan for this year. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any more questions? Oh, one? Okay, okay uh, thank you, Andy, for that really good talk. And um, from LCA in Linux Australia, I'd like to present oh, you a you small speaker's gift. Thank you. Thank you.